God never moves. He's where we are. When we sin, we are the ones putting the barrier up. So it's up to us to remove that barrier. And sometimes mentally, and the devil likes to trick us into thinking that we're all by ourselves, when in reality, we're, we're not. If you could turn within your Bibles to Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. And Micah chapter 7, it's near the end of the Old Testament. If you're uh, unfamiliar with its uh, place in the scriptures, Micah chapter 7. And as you're turning there, back in, let's see here, back in during the 16th and 17th century, 16th and 17th century, the Royal Navy would classify ships in their fleet by rates. And I have a picture here for you. Oh, this is just a, a simple picture. Oh, they're going to give me the, the clicker there. There we go. They would classify these ships by rates. And there were, there were several different kinds of rates. Thank you very much. And, uh, oh yeah, we're, oh, we're, there we go. And as you could see, these ships, and just in recent uh, years, I've been starting to really study and get kind of uh, fascinated by ships and how they worked and the different classifications of them. And they would uh, rate these by different kinds of, uh, of, they call them rates. One technique they would use in battle was this technique called the line of battle. Now, if you look at some of these different ships that you might see, these are just artist renditions of them. What we have here is different size ships. So for instance, you might have a third-rate ship, they would call it. A third-rate ship would have somewhere between 64 and 80 cannons on, on one side of the ship. 64 to 80 cannons. If you had a second-rate ship, this might have somewhere between 80 to 100 cannons on a ship. And if you were able to get a first-rate ship, this would have 100-plus cannons. And in the, uh, during this Royal Navy time, during the, um, the, the era of Napoleon, he started this system where he would actually put all of the cannons on one side of the ship. So instead of having it divided between two, he would put all cannons on one side, and he would, what you would call, started this, this uh, technique called the line of battle. Now, what, what would happen here is you would get a row of ships. Instead of just having ships just kind of spread out and attack fleets, they would go systematically, and they would formulate a line. And their goal was to go along the broadside of the enemy ship and cross and make a line and pass right through a ship. Now, can you imagine being a lonely ship floating out at sea, getting, getting caught away from the rest of the crew, away from the, the, your fleet, one ship by itself, having several large ships just cross by you, all with their cannons facing right at you? With this technique, it would only take one pass from a single line to take out any ship. There was a, it doesn't matter the size of the ship. When one ship would pass, it would fire their cannons, uh, here's a, a technique that was used. Imagine being a lonely ship stuck in the middle of that. It just takes one line. If you have three or four ships with third rate or higher, you could easily have, with one pass, three to four hundred cannons shooting at you just with one pass. And most ships could not take a beating such as that. And most lines consisted of 12 to at least 20 ships in a line. No ship could survive that. They would sail, they would float, and the only way for a single ship to survive and a barrage of cannons like this, the only way is if it itself had its own fleets at its side. But a ship by itself or a couple small ships all alone out on sea were no match. These rates, there was even certain special uh, ships of the first rate. There was only, as far as I could tell, during the Napoleon era, there was only five of them ever made, and they were nicknamed the Man-O-War ships. 
and these ships could easily have 120 plus cannons on one side. They were so expensive to make, only five were made during his, his reign. But what could one ship do against all that? Imagine, if you will, you're, uh, it's like a, a pack of wolves. There's a, the only way to survive a pack of wolves is to have a pack of wolves yourselves, to have your own pack to go up against it and then make the best pack win. But when you're by yourself, you're at a huge, a huge disadvantage. When you're alone, you're at a disadvantage. And nobody in life wants to be alone. Though some may say they'd prefer to be all by themselves, but even those people would prefer to have at least one person that they can cling to. One person that they can be with. Nobody really wants to be alone. Nor were we made that way. Life was not meant that way. God made Eve for a reason. Adam was alone. Most people don't actually want this. One of the benefits of being in a church like this, a local church, is the friendships and camaraderie that you can form. But church is not the solution to loneliness. It's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a stepping stone. It's, it's a great thing to have, but it's not the ultimate solution. Some would say marriage is the key, but even finding the person of your dreams is not the ultimate solution to loneliness. Friends at school, friends at work, or uh, those you meet at the gym, these are good and healthy to have good relationships, but these aren't the ultimate solution to life's loneliness. You're in Micah chapter 7. Look now in verse 5, if you will. The Bible says in Micah 7, verse 5, Trust ye not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, and the daughter riseth up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house not very encouraging if we had stopped it right there but verse 7 says therefore i will look into the lord i will wait for the god of my salvation my god will hear me we find here in micah that it's not just in people though people can help with this loneliness it's not just the the relationships we build ourselves around though they may be healthy and godly it is ultimately our God, Jesus Christ, that gives us, that fills that lonely void that we may seek and that we may have from time to time. When your friend is out of town and, and you and your spouse are at odds, when you failed your schoolmates and your coworkers are not trustworthy, who do you turn to? As Christians, we know the answer. We turn to Christ. But why... Is it that when we feel these moments of loneliness, oftentimes as Christians we fail to go to God? We know he's there, we know he loves us, we hear people preach on him all the time, but we still feel a disconnect from the Lord. Because no matter where we are in life, as long as God is there, we're never truly alone. But there are times where maybe, we, maybe we've sinned against the Lord, and now we feel disconnected from him. And by the way, sin does do that. Sin does separate us from the Lord. And sometimes we, we've, maybe we're in sin and we feel ourselves ostracized from our friends and from people that we once knew. And maybe because we don't think we're even worthy, worthy, to, be his save, worthy to be his children or to, be, to have communication with God, we now feel ourselves being at, at, at odds with God. And we feel like even God isn't there for us anymore. If we sin or fall away from God, am I... Am I still alone? Is God still, is he still there for us? I'm here to tell you today that no matter who you are, no matter where exactly you are in life, as long as God is around, you're never alone. Why is that? I'm going to explain to you why you're never actually alone when God is around. You're in Micah 7. Now we're going to go up to verse 19. Verse 19. Micah 7, 19, the Bible says, He will turn again. 
He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. When God is around, we're never truly alone. Lord, thank you for this afternoon. I pray that you would use me to speak the words that you've given to me. I pray that you would be with us in this room, that we'd be attentive and we would listen to the words that you've given to us this afternoon. Bless our service now, we pray in your name. Amen. You see, it's hard to distance ourselves completely from the Lord. And yes, when we sin, we are at odds with the Lord. And the Bible says in Psalms, if there's iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. But it doesn't mean that the Lord is running away from us. God never moves. He's where we are. When we sin, we are the ones putting the barrier up. So it's up to us to remove that barrier. And sometimes mentally, and the devil likes to trick us into thinking that we're all by ourselves, when in reality, we're, we're not. Especially knowing that God is there. And we see here in, in verse 18, Micah says here, Who is a God like unto thee? that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. You see, there's some things we need to understand about God. And first of all, God will always remove his anger. God will remove his anger. It says here in verse 19, he will turn again. Look in chapter 5 here in verse 3. You're in Micah. Let's just go uh, one page back to chapter 5 and verse 3. Chapter 5 and verse 3. The Bible says, Therefore will he give them up until the time that she will travail, that, uh, that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. That phrase here, shall return, in the Hebrew is the word shub, or S-H-O-O-B. Shall return, that's the same exact Hebrew word that we read in Micah 7, verse 19. He will turn again. God will always return. We've, we've read the Old Testament. We know that God is a God of anger. Now, it's righteous anger. He, he, it's, it's a kind of anger that you or I have difficulty quite getting. But God does, when he sees something that's not right, God does get angry and God does judge accordingly because he's perfect. But God doesn't stay angry. When you're at odds with a friend, you may say, oh yeah, everything's cool, it's all, it's all good. But it's so hard for us to really forget God is a God that is quick to forget. Look in verse 18. It says here in verse 18, who is, who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever. I find it interesting. At home, we'll be, uh, I'll be you know, getting a drink of water from the kitchen and then I hear fighting, right? I hear fighting and I come in and I hear Leah and Titus sometimes are fighting. Now, to be fair, Titus, normally it's Leah, um, but that's different. She can't hear me right now. She's in the nursery. I promise when they get older, I won't use them as all my illustrations. <laughs> but usually uh, it's something, you know, Leah wants something that's not hers and she's uh, fighting for it. Titus is usually very generous. She just gives it to her. But it's eventually, He's tired of giving her all his toys, and eventually he stands up and says, no, no, this is, this is my truck. Okay, I draw the line, I'll give you this one and this one, but you're not taking this one. And finally he draws the line, and then the fighting begins. And I come in the room, and you, know, you, you pull them apart, you put one over here, you put one over there, and, and normally you don't really know what happens, so you just take the toy and you put it up on the shelf, you know, and it's just nobody gets it now. And even though it's usually not one of the other person's fault, but that's just how things go. And, and um, so I separate them. And then once things are calm, I'll go back to the kitchen 
and I'd finish my drink of water or whatever I was doing. And then all of a sudden I hear a noise again. What do I hear? Laughing, giggling. So I go back into the kitchen and there they are. They've forgotten about that toy now. The toy they were fighting with, they found a new toy and now they're giggling, they're laughing, they're playing together like nothing happened four seconds ago. They were angry, they hated each other. You can see it in their eyes and four seconds later it's gone. Because kids don't want to be angry, they just want to play. But then you, you go up 20 years later, you get the same siblings or, or two friends, you know, at, at work or at church, and one person just says something that just really irritated you. Ah, and it just, it affected you. And, and you. But you're close friends, and ah, it's eating at you for a while, and eventually you go up to that person and you try to resolve it. You know, you, hey, you said something, and man, it just really got, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean that. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and then you, you kind of make it up, but then, you know, it's, it, it's still there. Even though you, you talked it over, it's still, it's still there and you remember it sometimes. And you'll be playing and, and then somebody, he'll, he'll say something similar and oh, you'll remember that hurt you felt. And it's so hard to really actually let go of, of, of hurt, of anger. And I wish we could just be five years old again, be two years old again, and just one minute, ah, you hate each other, the next minute, ah, it's all love again. And as adults, it's difficult for us to do that, but God can do that. God can actually turn his anger. Even though you may fail time and time and time again, you go back to God and say, Lord, I don't even know why you're listening to me right now. And I keep messing up here, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. And God says, forgiven. <laughs> and he means it. He doesn't just say it. Oh, yeah, 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 I forgive you. No, no, God means it. God will, the Bible says, turn again. He doesn't stay angry forever. That's the God that we serve. And this is why it gets difficult for us to truly be alone, because we serve a God that will remove his anger. But not just that. Look at verse 19 again. He will turn again. He will have, what's that word there? What is it? He will have compassion on us. These are commands, but he will have. This isn't he probably, most likely will. He will have compassion upon us. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm chapter 78. Now keep your, keep your finger here or your bookmark here, but look with me at Psalm chapter 78. Psalm 78 and verse 37. Psalm 78 is a fantastic, I mean, they're all fantastic chapters in the Bible. This is one I find myself going to often. So Psalm 78, no, most Psalms are pretty short. This one's one of the longer ones. But Psalm chapter 78 and verse 37, this is a Psalm of, of Asaph and he's basically giving us the history of Israel. Verse 37, he's talking about Israel. He says, For though their hearts was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant, but he, being full of, what's that word? Compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away. There it is again. And did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. You know, we live in a world that is full of passion, if you will, full of passion. And if you don't believe me, just go to a sports game and you'll see passion. You'll see it all the time. This even in Bible college, we would have uh, sports teams, you know, our, our basketball team would come. And we weren't a big college. We weren't even that great. But we would dress up. We would go crazy. We would paint. We would do all these things. And it, I guess it was the only time of the year we could actually put uh, paint on your face in Bible college. And we would go crazy. There's some big sports fans out there. 
And uh, there is, however, one sport that I think trumps all sports when it comes to sports fans. It's not really my sport. I'm not much of a soccer fan, but these people are nuts. I mean, this is a soccer, I don't even know, I forgot the, uh, where this was, but lighting things on fire and soccer fans are, they're actually a bit crazy. Um, maybe it's why I, I, well, fans, people are passionate about so many things. You remember, um, this is a dumb question, I know most of you remember this very well. There was this uh, small little shop, food, little restaurant thing that opened up earlier this year in Vancouver. I can't remember what it's called. Jolly Bee, is that what it's called? Yeah, that's right. Jolly Bee opened up and uh, people would wait in line. I, where's the article here? I got it here. This is, uh, this is, this is interesting. Uh, you know this already because, um, well, you know why. But uh, the Jolly Bee opened up in Vancouver early this year, and it's a, obviously it's a Filipino fast food restaurant, and it's on Granville Street. It opened its doors at 9 a.m. on a Friday, but people were lining up at 8:30 p.m. the night before. So there were people waiting in line for over 12 hours for the opening of Jolly Bee. Now, you know, I there's some foods I like. I would wait in line for. Uh, I'm American. I'm a big fan of Chick-fil-A and their chicken. And in my opinion, it's better than Jollibee. I didn't mean to offend anybody. That's just, that's just my opinion. You could just forget I said that. Um, and if one had opened up down the street, I don't know that it's worth waiting 12 hours in line for. I think a lot of people did it just for fun. But uh, I mean, if you consider that fun, I guess. But this, there are people who are passionate about sports. People who are passionate about food. And... By the way, I'm not, if, 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 if one of you are, are in this picture, <laughs> uh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just pointing out that we have different passions in life, okay? So I think I see, is that Angelique right over there or something? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just wasn't there. But we, uh, we, we can go through these things in life. There's also, um, back in 1995, I was alive. I was five years old. My family we were at Disneyland back in 1995, and we were there. Uh, we used to go once a year, but that particular year, uh, a ride had just been, it, it was the first year it was there. It had only been uh, out for, I think, one or two months when we arrived, and it was the Indiana Jones ride. I think I just read they're actually getting rid of it soon. But in 1995, we were there, and my dad wanted to go to the Indiana Jones ride. And so we went. We went up to the uh, entrance and we showed him our tickets and we had to have tickets back then. And he looked at us and he said, he laughed, he laughed. And uh, we said, what's so funny? He said, you wanna, you, you wanna ride Indiana Jones? And he said, yeah, we do. He said, okay, well, do you see these people in front of you? And we looked and there was a line that went all the way. Now, you don't really, if you don't know the park, basically where Indiana Jones was, there was a line that went all the way up around the park to the main entrance of the park. He was saying, you might be here at least six, seven hours if you want to ride this two and a half minute ride. But he said that these people are not going to move. And so my dad looked around and he's, you know, we, uh, he just decided it's not worth it, guys. We're not going to do it. We were there for a few days. So on the last day, we went there first thing in the morning. We went straight to Indiana Jones. And here we only had to wait for two and a half hours. Not too bad. Two and a half hours. Just kidding. It's absolutely terrible. We wait in line. I'm excited. We all we get in line, and I've told the story before. We we two and a half hours. We wait in line. We get to the front, and the the guy there, he looks down at me and he says, "Oh, uh, how tall are you, son?" And I said, "No, oh, no, you don't. No, <laughs> two two and a half. Hours. I mean, I'm five years old, but still, two and a half. No." And he said, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to come. I'm going to have to measure you over here on this sign. And I, I, was, I was trying to, you know, stretch. Oh, Lord, give me some inches. And I, I remember I walked over, and he put my back up, and the line came right over my head, the line to get in. And my dad came over, and he looked at the guy, and he's like, couldn't you just, you know, let him in? And this guy says, you know what? No. No, he can't. I don't want to lose my job. I'm sorry, sir, your son. So I did not get to write it that year. I had to wait 
probably wait like two years before I grew another inch. But eventually I was able to ride, and I can tell you right now it was pretty cool, but it most definitely was not worth six hours. I'll just, uh, I'll give you that. There are people who are passionate, who are passionate about certain things. Sports, there's food, there's roller coasters, there's all kinds of stuff in life that we may be passionate for. However, I'm not talking about passion. Because the Bible says, compassion. And there's actually a difference. You see, passion, dictionary here, any powerful or compelling emotion or feeling like love or hate. It's passion. But then there's compassion, which is feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune, accompanied by strong desire to alleviate the suffering. You see, there's, there's a little bit of there's a difference here. Passion is just, oh, I love this thing, or oh, I hate this thing. And then there's compassion where you are feeling the sympathy, the empathy, the sorrow of of someone else. God doesn't just have passion. God is talking about a, a, a compassion where he, he feels that emotional connection. It's, it's, it's deeper, it, it's stronger, if you will, on a, on a humanly level. There's an emotional, strong connection and a tie there. God will remain compassionate. In verse 19, he will have compassion on us. We, in our world today, we're, we're consumed with passion, which is often in the temporary it's okay, to, to, it's okay to, to like a sport and to like certain foods and to, you know, want to go on a roller coaster or something. But when that passion surpasses our compassion for eternal things, this is where the problem arises. Where is the Christian that can share the same level of passion for sports as they do compassion for the lost? When was the last time you made an effort to come soul winning or flyering? Or, or even just witness to a coworker or a friend at school. When was the last time we brought up the name Jesus at a family reunion with people in our family that aren't Christians? I know I haven't been to our, a family reunion in a long time, but I have a lot of aunts, a lot of uncles who aren't saved. Some were atheists, some who could care less about God. Where is the compassion for Christ? But man, no matter how far or bad we may be, God's compassionate love for us will always abound. Which is why it's so hard to be alone when God's around, because his compassion for us is overwhelming. Not only is, will he remove his anger, and not only is God will remain compassionate towards us, it says here in verse 19, he will subdue our iniquities. No matter how bad our sin is or what we may have done or how much we've ruined our lives or those around us, we can go to God right now and with a broken heart say, God, I'm sorry. God will look back at you and say, it's okay. You see, nobody else can say your sin is okay. Your sin is subdued. Your sin is forgiven. Nobody else can, can, can actually forgive your sin except Jesus. You can get, you can get, you could go up to somebody and say, I'm sorry for what I did, and they may say, I forgive you. But there's only one person who could actually forgive your sins and wipe your slate clean. And that's the God that we serve. One commentator put it this way, sin is an enemy to God and his people. It is too strong and too mighty for them. It reigns over them in a state of nature. They are under the power of it. They cannot... Get rid of it, its influence, its guilt, its punishment. But Christ has conquered it. And through Christ and through his forgiveness and his strength, we can get rid of this weight. We can get rid of this sin. He can subdue the sin that is over us. It's so hard to stay lonely when God is around because <laughs> God can and wants to forgive us from anything that might be between us. Anything that might create that, that loneliness that we may be feeling, God wants to abolish it. How does God abolish our sin? Look in verse 19. Not only will he turn, turn again and have compassion and subdue our iniquities, 
but he will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. The ocean is very deep. In fact, most of it is very deep. There are some small portions that are shallow where you could snorkel on and, and swim around safely. But the, officially, anything deeper in the ocean, anything that's deeper than 200 meters, is considered the deep sea. But the average depth of the entire ocean is about 3.5 kilometers deep, which is equal to, this is an American term, but if you were to take the Statue of Liberty and stack one on top of each other 47 times, that would equal the average depth of our ocean. Of course, we're not talking about the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench, the Western Pacific, just off the coast of Guam. There, down there, the deepest part of our ocean is somewhere around just short of 11 kilometers down. Just to give you perspective, you could pick up Mount Everest. Mount Everest is, oh, is just short of nine kilometers. You could pick up Mount Everest and set it inside, still have two kilometers to go. The average height of our commercial airliners travels around 10 kilometers high. That is how deep parts of our ocean are. Below 200 meters, where there is so little light, you enter into the twilight zone. And once you pass 1,000 meters, the water is completely devoid of light. And then you have reached what we call the deep sea. Only three people have ever actually visited the depths of the Challenger Deep. Did you know we have a better mapping system on Mars than we do in our ocean floor? In fact, according to NASA, only between 5 to 15% of the ocean's floor depth have been surveyed by our sonar techniques at this point. That's because it's so expensive and time-consuming and it's so dark and it's so deep, we can't really access it. Even with all the technology we have today, it's very, very difficult to access the bottom of the ocean floor. You know how easy it is to lose something in water? Uh, these glasses here I bought in Australia because in 2019, when we were there, we were playing frisbee on the beach, and the water was not deep. We were playing, I mean, the water was ankle deep, and the frisbee went up, and I went up for a, a jump, and uh, we'll just say, for sake of story, I caught it. I don't remember if I caught it or not. I probably didn't, but I just say I caught the frisbee, and I, when I came down, my glasses fell right at my feet, but I was still, I mean, the water was just barely over my feet, so I didn't go to grab them immediately. Because, you know, they just fell right between my feet. So I waited, and I saw a friend, and I, I threw the frisbee back, and then I went down for my glasses. Gone. I don't know. I don't know. So, and of course I'm blind without my glasses. So I'm like, uh, if you've seen Scooby-Doo, you know, Thelma, when she loses her glasses, I don't know. I'm old. So I'm looking around, and I'm digging the dirt up, and people think I'm building a sandcastle, and I'm like, help me find my glasses. And we're scrambling to find my glasses. I don't know where they are. Gone forever. Actually, just at camp recently, I think uh, somebody, uh, Amia, she lost her glasses. And the water wasn't that deep, but it's so easy to lose your glasses. If you're on a boat in the depths of the ocean and your glasses fall off in the water, you're never going to see them again. It's gone. It's history. As vast and as deep and as unknown as the ocean is, when God forgives you, it's like he takes your sin and he's putting it in the deepest, darkest part of the ocean never to be found again. In my opinion, it's probably one of the best illustrations you can give when it's speaking of how far and how, how far away God removes our sins. Isaiah thirty-eight seventeen. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. It's so hard to be alone when God is around because he's a, such a God of compassion. He's a, a God who's easy to remove his anger. He subdues our iniquities. He casts our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And the last thing he says here in verse 20, thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob 
and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. The last amazing thing we'll speak about God here is that God will always keep his promises. Always. God promises something, he will never go back on it. God is always there, he's waiting for us, and he wants us. God promises that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful, he is just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, yeah, I know what that says, but I did this, Lord. God says, but I promised, if you confess your sins, I will be faithful, I will be just to forgive you your sins. Yeah, but Lord, I don't know if you heard what I said. I did, I did this. And God says, I understand, but I will forgive you. And I will cast it away because I always keep my promise. Booker T. Washington uh, describes, uh, he is a, a famous slave himself back in America during the, the harsh times of slavery. He lived through this time and through the Emancipation Proclamation and he wrote, he wrote this book, Booker T. Washington. He described meeting an ex-slave from, from, from Virginia. And you can see this in his book called Up From Slavery. This is what he said. He said, I found that this man had made a contract with his master two or three years previous to the Emancipation Proclamation to the effect that the slave was to be permitted to buy himself and by paying so much per year for his own body would allow him freedom to go about and do as he pleased. Finding that he could secure better wages in Ohio, this man, he went there. And when freedom came, when that proclamation was made, he was still in debt to his master some $300. Notwithstanding, the proclamation freed him from any obligation to his master. This man, not under the obligation to do so, still saved up, worked hard, and went back to his master years after the proclamation had been finished and, re and paid his debt, his $300 he still owed. Even though slavery is wrong, even though everything about it didn't make sense, when the man told me that he knew that he did not have to pay his debt, but that he had given his word to his master, and his word he had never broken. He felt that he could not enjoy his freedom till he had fulfilled his promise to his master. If this man, who really was unlawfully even in slavery in the first place, could still have the character in himself, the, 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 the ability to go back and give that master the money, to free himself, though he was already free. If a man can do that, imagine how well God will keep his promises to you and to me. His promises to save us. And that someday, someday we will stand before him. And if we have confessed our sins and our name is written in the Lamb's book of life, we're going to get to live with him someday. Imagine that time, what it will be like. No more sickness, no more pain, no more aging, perfect children. Can't wait for God to keep his promise on that. You see why it's so hard to be alone when God is around? He's very difficult to run from because he's able to remove his anger. He remains compassionate. He forgives our sins. He forgets our sins. And he always keeps his promises. God loves you. And he wants to be with you. Are you feeling lonely today? You don't need to. Because God is with you. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.